Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us for today's webinar. Today we'll be talking about CRISPR, the genome editing technology that has been lauded as one of the most important scientific breakthroughs of this century. CRISPR allows us to insert, add, or delete genes inside living cells with far greater precision, efficiency, and flexibility than previously possible. It's already accelerating biomedical research and enhancing crop yields, and it's poised to revolutionize our ability to treat genetic diseases. Our goal today is to provide an overview of this disruptive technology and discuss the hurdles it currently faces, as well as the applications we can expect to see in upcoming years. This live presentation will run for about 45 minutes and will be followed by a brief question and answer section. During the presentation, please type your questions in the chat panel so that we can discuss them. And if you have any technical problems during the presentation, please report them via the chat tool or send them directly to webinar at prescouter.com. My name is Dr. Charles Wright, and I'll be your webinar host for today. I'm one of Prescouter's project architects specializing in the medical industry. As a project architect at Prescouter, I've looked into a range of technologies that are impacting the life sciences and healthcare space, running the gamut from lab on a chip to artificial intelligence. I believe that CRISPR is one of the most exciting technologies in this area, both because of the variety of possible applications, but also because the rapid pace of advances means that we could see those impacts not decades, but mere years down the road. So I'm excited to be discussing CRISPR today with you. I'll first give you a brief overview of how this technology works, then I'll explain a bit about what we do at Prescatter. After introducing the panelists, we'll jump into the discussion. At the end, we'll have time for questions from the audience. Again, you can type those into the chat box throughout the presentation, and we'll answer as many as we can. Let's begin with an overview of the CRISPR-Cas system in its natural context, as an adaptive immune system in bacteria and archaea. The CRISPR sequences, so-called because they consist of clustered, regularly interspaced, short palindromic repeats, are a repository of past infections. The unique DNA spacer sequences between these repeats contain snippets of dangerous viruses, which allows a cell to recognize those sequences and mount a successful defense against the next infection. Close by the CRISPR sequences are genes encoding for Cas or CRISPR-associated enzymes, which carry out the task of recognizing the matching foreign DNA and destroying it. So how does this all work? First, the cell transcribes the spacer sequences into RNA molecules, which form a complex with a Cas enzyme and drift through the cell until coming into contact with foreign DNA complementary to the RNA. When this occurs, the CRISPR RNA binds tightly to the matching DNA, allowing the Cas enzyme to precisely cut the DNA and thus prevent the virus from replicating. After successfully killing off an invading virus, other proteins cut up pieces of the viral DNA and store them as CRISPR spacer sequences to prepare for future infections. We're going to focus the rest of this talk on one specific system, CRISPR-Cas9, which is a simplified, programmable version that has been modified to edit genomes. There are four basic steps to using CRISPR-Cas9. First, scientists create an sgRNA, a synthetic, single-guide RNA molecule that has everything needed to target the desired genomic DNA sequences and to complex with a Cas protein. A Cas9 nuclease and complex with the sgRNA is then delivered into the cell. Cas9 is an endonuclease that can cleave almost any DNA sequence complementary to its guide RNA. When the guide sequence binds to its matching target DNA from the cell's genome, the Cas9 enzyme cleaves the DNA at a specific location. This allows for editing or deletion of existing genes or insertion of new ones. Now let's take a look at some of the milestones in the history of CRISPR since its discovery three decades ago. In 1987, Japanese scientists came across unusual repeating sequences in the E. coli genome. In subsequent years, researchers discovered similar repeats in other species of bacteria and archaea, which were eventually given the name CRISPR. Over the next two decades, researchers worked to solve the mystery of this system. In 2007, food scientists at Danisco studying the bacteria used to make yogurt confirmed experimentally that CRISPR is a prokaryotic immune system. Five years later, in 2012, Jennifer Doudna and Emmanuel Charpentier created a programmable CRISPR-Cas9 system with, in their words, considerable potential. They simplified the system down to the Cas9 nuclease and a synthetic guide RNA, allowing it to precisely cut and paste pieces of DNA into a genome. Shortly thereafter, 
Feng Zhang and George Church successfully adopted this system for genome editing in eukaryotic cells. 2013 saw the first use in mouse, human, and plant cells, as well as a demonstration of its potential therapeutic significance when it was used to cut HIV out of the genome of infected human cells. In the following year, Chinese scientists created monkeys with CRISPR-engineered targeted mutations. In 2015, Chinese scientists also used CRISPR-Cas9 for the first time to edit human embryos. Even though the resulting cells were not viable, researchers in the field called for an international moratorium on making heritable changes to the human genome until the ethical implications could be fully discussed. 2016 saw important regulatory decisions for the future of CRISPR, including a determination by the USDA that it will not regulate crops edited with CRISPR as GMOs, and NIH approval of the first human trial to use CRISPR gene editing with the goal of modifying human T cells to attack cancer cells. This year, CRISPR has been in the news quite a bit, as a patent debate recently ended when the U.S. Patent Office determined that key patents from the Broad Institute do not interfere with patents from the University of California. And finally, the National Academies of Science and Medicine recently published a report outlining the criteria that must be met in order for clinical trials of germline editing to proceed. CRISPR could impact almost every field of biology. One major application in biomedical research is to create anim um, model animals with multiple specific mutations within a single generation, dramatically reducing the time and effort required to generate new disease models. Last year, DuPont released its first commercial agricultural product developed through CRISPR-enabled advanced breeding technologies. In the future, we could edit crops to make them tastier, more nutritious, and more robust to environmental stresses. We could also potentially use gene drive to modify the genome of an entire species. Last year, researchers reported CRISPR-Cas9 constructs that could be used to suppress mosquito populations to levels that do not support malaria transmission. In terms of therapeutics, CRISPR could be used to create a powerful new generation of drugs, including antibiotics that could target only pathogenic bacteria and to which those bacteria can't easily develop resistance, and antivirals that could specifically target viral RNA to prevent infections. Researchers have already used CRISPR to correct the sickle cell mutation in the cells that eventually turn into red blood cells, and to fix mutations in the blood stem cells of patients with a rare immunodeficiency disorder. Once applied to humans, we could use CRISPR-based therapeutics to correct the mutations responsible for a host of genetic diseases. And finally, with editing of germline cells, we could correct, in a heritable manner, the genes responsible for genetic disorders, or potentially use this technology to select for desired traits in humans. Before we get into today's panel discussion, I'd like to briefly tell you more about Prescatter. You can think of us as your personal research assistant. As a project architect at Prescatter, I get asked questions about disruptive technologies like artificial intelligence, blockchain, and CRISPR. Prescatter helps companies like yours by providing answers to the most pressing questions. By helping solve your innovation goals, we reduce your tactical work, thus allowing you to focus on strategy. To date, we've helped over 300 clients, including GE Healthcare, BD, and Pfizer, to name a few in the healthcare and pharmaceutical space. We can simplify the Prescatter process down to three easy steps. First, you provide us your question or something you'd like to learn more about. Here we discuss criteria for the people, organizations, or technologies you want Prescatter to research. For instance, if your company is thinking of developing CRISPR-based products, what applications would best align with your capabilities? Next, Prescatter assembles a team of scholars from our network. The scholars are recruited from leading research institutions worldwide and are all under non-disclosure agreements. They use a combination of their own human intelligence networks and proprietary software developed at Prescatter to answer your query. After a few short meetings with Prescatter's team, and through interviews and analysis of the information, you receive a deliverable that reflects your innovation needs. On average, our clients find that the reports contain about 80% of information that is new and relevant, which allows them to perform informed decisions and, more importantly, take action. If you have any questions about how the Prescatter process operates, please feel free to email webinar at prescatter.com. And now, we'll move into the panel discussion. First, I'd like to introduce you to the guest panelists. John, could you please introduce yourself? 
Hi, my name is John Dench. I'm an associate director here at the Broad Institute, uh, where I apply the latest technologies in functional genomics, uh, which for a while was RNA interference, or RNAi, and now is CRISPR technology uh, to understand gene function and to determine how gene dysfunction leads to human disease. Thanks, John. And Guru, could you please tell us more about you? Hi, uh, it's a pleasure to be here. My name is uh, Guru. I work at the uh, University of Nebraska Medical Center as an associate professor in the Department of Developmental Neuroscience. My expertise is uh, genome editing, uh, particularly we use genome editing for developing animal models and also we develop technologies for improving how to edit uh, animal genomes and my model is mouse system. Uh, thanks, Guru. And finally, uh, Shui Bing, could you tell us a bit about you? Uh, my name is Shui Bing Chen. Uh, my lab is interested in using CRISPR-based gene editing approach to uh, perform precise gene editing in human prepotent stem cells, which include human embryonic stem cells and induced prepotent stem cells. And we differentiate these cells into the cell type we're interested in and then use it to perform disease modeling. And the ultimate goal is to perform, uh, adapt this disease modeling platform to high throughput manner so that we can perform drug discovery to identify a gene or mutant specific drugs for precision therapy. Thank you, Shui Bing. The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. With that, let's get into our panel discussion. So, scientists continue to improve upon the uh, original CRISPR-Cas9 system. Uh, for example, by modifying the guide RNA, modifying the Cas9 endonuclease, and identifying new endonuclease proteins, such as CPF1. Uh, what enhancements to the system do you think will be the most impactful? Uh, and let's start with John. Right. So I think that one of the one of the most important parts of of CRISPR when we when we start to think about how it will be used therapeutically is getting a good grip on its specificity. So the off-target effects of uh, Cas9, any Cas9 protein, whether it's as pyogenes Cas9, Staphylococcus Cas9, or the CPF family. Uh, you know, we need to know that it will cut where we want it to cut and not that it will cut at other places that we don't know about. Uh, so I think that, you know, one of the enhancements of, of greater specificity is going to be really critical. I think another enhancement that people are, are working on, uh, there's been some great work by David Liu's lab at Harvard and some other, other groups around here, uh, where instead of using Cas9 as an enzyme to cut DNA, you can actually inactivate the Cas9 enzyme so that it's, it, it no longer cuts DNA, but instead is an RNA-guided DNA binding protein. Uh, and now you can recruit different enzymatic functions to a specific locus of DNA and, for example, edit bases that way without having to do a first round of cutting. And I think, uh, you know, in the next couple of years, uh, we're going to see uh, a lot of growth in that area where uh, we, we do gene editing without having to first do a cut of the DNA. So uh, I can add uh, a couple of things about what are the enhancements uh, in terms of CRISPR-Cas system for animal genome engineering. Uh, certainly CRISPR system has been a revolutionary tool, but one of the major uh, things that we still need is increasing the HDR capability. That, is, that means like increasing how efficiently we can insert foreign sequences at the Cas9 cut sites. That is in terms of uh, using CRISPR tool for basic biomedical research where you develop animal models and also for uh, developing cell, cell models. In terms of uh, therapeutic uh, applications, uh, uh, one enhancement I would certainly think of very important is uh, delivery methods. We certainly need to work very hard on developing good delivery methods. In addition to specificity, what uh, John uh, just added, uh, delivery is also one is also one of the important tools that important area that we need to work on enhancing CRISPR Cas system further. So regarding increase the homolog recombination efficiency, um, there are some um, very nice work has um, identified a small molecule that may help to do that. And another enhancement um, we are quite interested in is to see right now when people use um, Cas9 system, they basically uh, knock out a small piece of DNA or uh, now in certain mutations, but is there possible to use CRISPR-Cas9 to modify a big chunk of DNA, such as maybe 10 K, um, base pair or even larger? So that's maybe something also uh, we've kept some progress in the next several years. 
So you've uh, brought up a few of the hurdles that researchers are attempting to address. Um, looking at the technical limitations that are currently facing the CRISPR technology, including presence of off-target effects or efficiency of homology-directed repair, which do you think are the most important to overcome, especially to ensure applicability of CRISPR outside of research? And let's start Sorry. again, John. Yeah, so I think there, there's really two critical issues, uh, you know, especially, as you note, uh, going outside the realm of, of, of uh, biology research in the lab. Uh, I think one of them is definitely the off-target sites. Uh, you know, if you're going to therapeutically apply CRISPR, you need to know where it is, where it, else it may edit. And that's actually a detection issue. It's a question of if you, if you put uh, CRISPR reagents into several hundred million cells, uh, how can you be sure that in one of those cells you didn't inactivate a tumor suppressor gene, uh, which would obviously have very negative consequences for the patient. Uh, so what is our limit of detection of figuring out where the off-target edits are? That, that's one area uh, where the technology is going to need to advance in the next couple of years. And then the second is an old problem. Uh, it's a problem for small molecules, it's a problem for uh, previous gene editing tools, whether that's zinc fingers or talons, and that's certainly delivery. Uh, how do you make sure that the reagents you want get into the cells that you want them to get to? Uh, so how do you deliver CRISPR, which is, a, you know, Cas9 is a large protein, you need to deliver nucleic acid components in well, as well. How do you deliver those where you want? Uh, and I think, again, that that's, that's an old problem uh, from a lot of previous therapeutics, so we're not starting from ground zero, uh, but solving it with CRISPR is, is going to be a challenge. So, uh, in terms of using CRISPR technology very efficiently for both the research as well as any kind of applications, one of the important challenge that, in my opinion, is still HDR, that is homology directed repair. So CRISPR can very, very efficiently cut at many genomic sites. You choose uh, uh, 10 guides, uh, 9 out of 10 will always work, almost always work in uh, cutting the genome, but out of those 9, how many will really be efficient in inserting the foreign sequence at the genomic cut site? Maybe, in my opinion, about one or two, uh, if you are lucky enough. So that said, it is still a major technical limitation is uh, the HDR. So uh, this, as I said uh, previously, also like this resonates for both for uh, basic research as well as for developing animal models for uh, drug discovery research or any kind of applications. So uh, in terms of mouse model generation, nearly 9 out of 10 animal models are not just uh, complete knockouts. They definitely need to be precisely modified at the cut sites. That means the technical limitation of HDR is one of the still major challenge in terms of uh, uh, using CRISPR-Cas technology. That's in my opinion. So in addition to the HDR efficiency and uh, delivery that John and Guru already mentioned, um, there is also another challenge uh, limited the application of CRISPR in the stem cell system is actually the stem cell differentiation efficiency because when we uh, study stem cells, we need to differentiate the stem cells into certain cell type we are interested in. And however, uh, right now is in for several cell types we for uh, many cell types, we still don't have a good way to do that yet. So how to get the mature adult human cells that carry the mutation that CRISPR knocking is still a challenge. Uh, now moving on from uh, this discussion of the challenges facing CRISPR now, I want to talk about um, some of the lessons that we can learn from um, similar technologies. So the next question is for John. You've worked uh, extensively in the development and use of functional genomic techniques, uh, in particular RNAi. Uh, in your opinion, what are the lessons we can learn from the obstacles that RNAi has faced in its applications that could be applied to inform um, our prognosis of um, CRISPR moving forward? Right. So I think that it, it's very clear that the reason that we're talking about off-target effects so much from the earliest days of CRISPR technology is that that proved to be a weakness of RNAi technology, uh, that there were off-target effects, uh, which is unsurprising. I mean, uh, you know, every small molecule has an off-target effect too, right? Uh, so it's unsurprising that RNAi had off-target effects, but I think as a field, uh, we didn't quite pay enough attention to it or stress it quite enough, uh, you know, at the outset. And especially, you know, as more and more people 
had the technology in their hands, uh, it sort of became less and less clear that off-target effects were a problem. But it abs they absolutely were, uh, and thus the uh, you know ability to to look for them explicitly and to make sure you're not uh, publishing erroneous results on the basis of insufficient information uh, is something that has been much more of a focus with CRISPR technology at the outset. Uh, and it's also worth pointing out that you know two of the main technologies that, that go along with CRISPR using it in the lab uh, are both DNA synthesis and next generation sequencing. And those technologies were much more nascent uh, when RNAi was first discovered. I mean, there was no next generation sequencing then. Uh, so the CRISPR field has been able to iterate much more rapidly and learn much more quickly about on-target effects, off-target effects, because those uh, complementary technologies have been available uh, that weren't available when, when RNAi was first discovered. Uh, so I think that uh, you know we've been able to move the field faster uh, because of that, and and, and hopefully uh, have fewer uh, missteps uh, than we had with with RNAi. Great. Uh, and if we compare CRISPR to some of its predecessors, like uh, zinc finger nucleases or talon, uh, what makes it unique from them? Right. So with with uh, CRISPR. It's very easy for anyone in a lab to get moving with it because the only thing you need to do to program the system to bind to a new place in the genome is 20 nucleotides of DNA that you clone into a plasmid and then you express it as RNA. Uh, this is stuff that high school students can do. So it's a very accessible technology. Previous nuclease technologies, whether it's tail end nucleases or zinc finger nucleases, you were the programming capacity was dictated by many, many, many amino acids. And so in order to do that, you had to assemble a very large uh, protein expression vector uh, to target a new zinc finger pair or a new tail and pair to a new uh, spot in the genome. And that was something that would take days. It was generally something that uh, you could not just walk into the lab and do. Uh, and thus, neither of those technologies really had the reach into every possible lab uh, in the way that CRISPR does. And it's largely because the the activation energy, the barrier to entry, is just so much lower for CRISPR. Yeah, and now, um, so turning our focus to some of those uh, uses of CRISPR um, within the lab, I'd like to um, address the next question to Guru. Um, so you focus on developing animal models using CRISPR. Um, Looking back um, over the last few years and thinking of where we'll be um, in the next um, five years, uh, what are the uh, main technical challenges that remain in this area? Um, and how do you think CRISPR-based development of animal models um, is allowing us to create better disease models and aiding in drug discovery? Uh, thank you very much. So uh, before I address uh, this question, I would like to give a, like a two minutes perspective about uh, animal genome engineering and how this has been, animal genome engineering has been practiced for last four decades. So uh, there are two types of animal models that anybody can create. One is called a transgenic, where you introduce a foreign DNA into the animal genome. And another one is knockout, that is a taking a DNA piece out of the mouse model, animal model, that is called knockout. And the third, there is another one, third one called like a knock-in, where you take out a piece and put a new piece back. So for the first type, that is a transgenic, what you need is you just take a DNA piece that you want to create a transgenic animal model and inject into one day old zygotes, that is fertilized zygotes, and create a transgenic animal model. But whereas creating knockout and knock-in, you need some specialized tools called embryonic stem cells, without which uh, technology could not have been done using uh, previous models. So what CRISPR-Cas system and ZFMs and talents have been able to achieve is bypass the use of embryonic stem cells and directly go into zygotes to create animal model which is knockout and also knock-in. Now coming to knockout, what CRISPR can do is you just hit the gene what you want and uh, let the DNA repair process uh, handle it by uh, non-homologous enjoining and that creates a knockout whereas inserting CRISP, uh, foreign sequence that is a little bit challenge that, that let us talk about. Now, what are the main technical challenges of applying CRISPR-Cas to animal models? So, if you think about a, a mouse as an animal model that has been used for last uh, four decades to create transgenic and knockout and knock-in animal models, uh, nearly 75% uh, of the animal models are knock-in or 
not kind of like uh, replacing the genome sequence. And also there is a specialized uh, tool called conditional knockout where you use CreLock system, you introduce two lock and uh, in the genome of interest, a uh, gene of interest and you breed that mouse with a Cree system to create conditional knockout. That said, if you have to create conditional knockout and knock in models, you need to have HDR worked out. That means the technical challenge still remains is that HDR. Second thing is uh, uh, when uh, the field start, started transitioning from traditional methods to CRISPR system, one of the challenges that everybody faced is transitioning, injecting RNA molecules instead of DNA. So previously everybody was used to using DNA and first one or two years there was some technical challenge how to prepare RNAs and then how to inject those things into the system. But uh, very lately there are some technical improvements where you just order a single guide RNA and they come as lyophilized tubes, you just resuspend them and inject them. Second part of the question that is how will CRISPR based development of animal models allow us to create better disease models and aid in drug discovery. So uh, I just want to emphasize here is that like CRISPR has already uh, made a lot of uh, paradigm shifts in animal genome engineering to create better models. Number one, as I said before, you don't need embryonic stem cells. And uh, number two, you can create something called footprint free uh, genome edited models. What I mean by saying this footprint free is if you want to create a specific disease model where you just want to change one mutation, that is one point mutation, previous technologies used to use something called like positive selection marker where you put a large uh, unwanted genome next to the uh, mutation site that is called footprint. Here using CRISPR-Cas system you don't need that and then it can cleanly create animal models that you are interested in for any kind of disease model. And for drug discovery, yes, uh, uh, disease models are still uh, used uh, as uh, commonly as uh, they are available. But at the same time, we need uh, more versatile type of animal models where large chunks of uh, animal genomes have been replaced with the human sequence, so-called humanized animal models. That's where industry is going to go forward in the next few years to create humanized animal models with very ease and uh, on a routine basis. Thank you. Um, and so for the next question, um, I'd like to ask about um, the uses of CRISPR for pluripotent stem cells. Um, these are cells that have been genetically modified to behave like embryonic stem cells with the ability to form any adult cell type. Um, so this question is for uh, Shui Bing. You focus uh, your research um, especially on um, translational um, applications with the ultimate goal of replacement therapy and drug discovery. Um, how can CRISPR aid in this area of research and what are the translational or therapeutic use cases that you foresee? So uh, if you can put, move to the next slide, I have a, a summary brief introduction about the human propotent stem cells. So there are two, um, as Charles has mentioned, is a, a cell type that are capable to, in theory, contribute to all type of cells in the human body. And another characteristic of propotent stem cells is they are capable to self-renew or unlimited self-renew. So in that scenario, it's catch a lot of attention because we think, uh, it's believed that proposed stem cell can be used as a resource to contribute to um, different type of uh, human cells that we can use for disease modeling or drug discovery. Next slide, please. And CRISPR has, has been used as a very powerful um, tool in stem cell study, both as a research tool and therapeutic tools. Regarding the research tool here, I just list two uh, examples. One is to create reporter lines. When we study human propotent stem cell, although they are able to differentiate into different type of cells, but we have uh, the efficiency to generate different type of cell are not 100 percent. So if we want to use it uh, therapeutically applicable, we will need a approach that we can identify the cell we are deriving and enrich the cells we are deriving. So in that scenario, uh, we reporter line will be very helpful. So in which case, we basically put some fluorescence or luminescence uh, reporter genes in the locus of the marker genes. Um, so here I just put one example that we make, we use CRISPR to knock in an amateur reporter into the um, 
myosin heavy chain locus so that we can identify the human ESL derived cardiomyocyte, which are the red cells. Uh, the second application is we can use this as a tool to study the biological function of certain genome mutations in human development and human cells. Um, so using the CRISPR technology, we can have um, we can make isogenic control of proponent stem cells in which the disease caused gene can be cracked uh, can be either knocked out or the disease caused mutation can be um, corrected. So in that scenario, we have something we call as isogenic control. And then we can differentiate the cells into a step ma stepwise manner which model the human development. Here I just put an uh, example when, uh, to differentiate human and proponent stem cells into pancreatic beta cells. We include the generational definitive endoderm, pancreatic progenitor, and glucose responding cells. So we can differentiate this human proponent stem cell and CRISPR um, derived uh, the isogenic cell derived using the CRISPR technology, and we can compare the cell type at each individual step. So we can understand how this gene or certain mutation affects the generation of definitive endoderm pancreatic progenitor or the um, final goal product of pancreatic-like cells. Can we go to the next slide, please? So regarding the therapeutic applications, people are interested in proponent stem cells because they can either generate cells that can be used for cell replacement therapy or they can generate cells that for disease modeling. For both cases, CRISPR actually can um, contribute to the field a lot. For example, if we first derive, we use reprogramming to derive patient-specific human proponent stem cells. At this stage, the cells still carry the disease cause mutations, and people can use CRISPR um, based uh, gene editing technology to perform gene correction, and we can cr pro um, generate the proponent stem cell um, with the corrected gene, and so then differentiate the cells to generate the tissue or organs, and then put it back into the human body for replacement therapy. And another application is uh, similar as disease model, we, we can um, create the isogenic human proponent stem cell and differentiate in the cell type we're interested in. And then we can, uh, so the, this patient specific cells can uh, show some cellular defects. Since we have the isogenic control that we know the cellular defect is due to that particular gene uh, knockout or particular mutations. So then we can adapt it to the high throughput screening platform and screen either FDA approved drug or the drug in the clinical trial so that we can identify the drugs that can rescue this gene or uh, mutation specific defects that we can design it for the precession therapy. And for these uh, applications that you've mentioned, uh, what are the major hurdles um, currently facing us um, towards achieving those? So it's one major hurdle is still how to get a very highly efficient uh, homolog recombination so that we can uh, e efficiently get gene corrected clone or isogenic clone that we can use for either replacement therapy or disease modeling. And the second question is how can we have a way so that we can efficiently differentiate the proponent stem cells in the cell type we're interested in. Great. Thank you. So uh, when we speak about such an exciting technology as CRISPR, uh, we inevitably come across a lot of hype, uh, particularly with respect to the uh, potential practical applications. So in addition to the technical challenges that we've already discussed, there are many regulatory and ethical considerations. Um, for some applications like gene drives and designer babies, there's still considerable debate about whether to even pursue them. So. Um, the question for the full panel is, uh, when you look at the claims that are being made today, ranging from those agricultural enhancements to therapeutic applications, um, what do you think are the greatest challenges um, still facing us towards achieving them? Um, we can uh, start with John again. Right. So I think, unsurprisingly, uh, there's a lot of people out there who want people to click on their website, and so they write stories about, oh, how designer babies are coming, and, you know, we start to get into some very... Uh, impractical and, you know, in my mind, kind of pointless discussions over, uh, over things like that. You know, we're not, we're not going to have designer babies soon. We're probably not going to have designer babies ever. Uh, 
making babies the old-fashioned way is pretty darn fun, and that's how the seven billion people on planet Earth are going to continue to make babies going forward. Uh, you know, I, I think that 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 talk of that sort, it's you know, it's something that you you talk about at the Thanksgiving table with Aunt Muriel uh, because you got to talk about something, but it's not something that you know any scientist is really uh, you know is their driving goal in life. Now, there are there certainly some circumstances uh, where doing gene editing. Uh, you know, on, on pre-implantation embryos or something like that would be beneficial. Yes, there are some, some very small corner cases. Uh, but the idea that this is, uh, uh, this is a technology that's going to sweep the, <laughs> sweep the nation, yeah, that's not going to happen. Uh, and I think th the reason for that, uh, you know, ignoring the, the ethics and the morality of it for just a second, but the reason for that is that CRISPR therapy, whether for designer babies or for curing disease, uh, it's very invasive. Uh, it's not a trivial procedure. So let's say uh, you know you have you're born with a, a blood disorder, and you would you know it'd be beneficial to have your hematopoietic stem cells edited. So you need to have your hematopoietic stem cells taken out. They need to be edited in the lab. They need to be verified to be safe, and they need to be put back in. That's not swallowing a pill. That is a medical procedure. Uh, that has a lot of people uh, invasively getting cells from your body. It has people manipulating those cells in the lab, and it has people putting those cells back into you. Uh, that is that is not trivial. Uh, so I think that as we look for you know CRISPR to enter the clinic, uh, you know in many cases it's not going to be uh, just a trivial here swallow this pill and you'll be fine. Uh, it'll be much more invasive than we generally think about uh, most most drugs. Yes, uh, I would like to go next. So uh, certainly what uh, John said is a very concise and very uh, sh uh, summarized way of uh, putting the answer to this particular question, which this perhaps is the most difficult question for anybody working on CRISPR system to just answer in a very short way. Uh, nonetheless, this is a very difficult question that comes up multiple times in multiple seminars, webinars, conferences, and all the time. So one thing I just want to uh, echo what uh, John said is that like uh, are we there yet for treating or making uh, designer babies? I don't think we are there yet. It still takes a lot of effort from both scientists, drug discovery companies and also ethical uh, bodies to come up with a total solution for bringing the CRISPR to therapeutic uh, areas. Uh, so that said, are, uh, are there uh, advances uh, in some of the basic research areas? Yes, definitely there are a lot of advances made in uh, uh, showing proof of principle concepts that like, yes, this is, uh, this is like sickle cell anemia or muscular dystrophy, they can be cured in uh, 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 laboratory conditions and also some of the gene drive systems, they have been proven to work in the laboratory conditions, but how far and how soon they can come into uh, reality, we'll have to just wait and see. So as far as agricultural enhancements, we are already seeing some improvements in uh, crops uh, to feed uh, the modern world. Uh, so I, I anticipate in terms of like uh, uh, drug discovery or therapeutic applications, I would see agricultural enhancements would come uh, more faster than the other uh, two areas. So uh, designer babies, as John said, uh, I don't know, maybe we, uh, down in the list. So perhaps uh, agricultural enhancements would be the most important thing that the uh, world will address using a uh, revolutionary tool like a CRISPR-Cas system. So I, I think John and Guru already gave a very good summary on this question. And I think um, I just want to add one point that uh, when we discuss as CRISPR is a very powerful, very efficient gene editing tool, but when we discuss about the regulatory or the ethical concerns about CRISPR technology, we might want to put it in the big context of uh, other gene editing tools and it's not really anything specially novel. So uh, that's a lot of discussion on that already, so that should be put in the consideration. That's a great point. That's a really great point. Thanks for bringing that up. Uh, now moving um, into some of the um, applications for CRISPR that we can expect to see. What are you most excited about coming up in the next few years? And looking much further down the road, what about the next decade or two? What do you think is the most um, 
um, exciting potential applications that we'll see with CRISPR. Let's start so, again with John. So from, from my perspective, you know, what we've been doing for a while here uh, is trying to figure out what our genome does. Uh, you know, we've had, the, we've had the sequence of the human genome, or we've had the sequence of a human genome uh, for, you know, over a decade and a half now, but we still don't know what the vast majority of the information need, means. Uh, and, you know, so first we tried to figure it out with RNAi, and that's a limited technology. So the more, uh, the more technologies we have in the tool belt to try to understand the information that our genome is telling us, uh, you know, that, that, that to me is the most exciting part of, of CRISPR technology in the coming years. Uh, because, you know, we, we, have, uh, we have so many genes and we have so many cell types and we don't know what most genes are doing in most cell types. Uh, and we certainly don't know how, uh, for, for the vast majority of genes, we don't know how gene dysfunction leads to disease. Uh, and we don't know how to interpret, uh, you know, the, the day where everyone has their genome sequence is not that far away. Because uh, technically that's quite possible, uh, but what we don't have is, is really any idea of how to interpret uh, all but the most obvious things. So I think that uh, the ability of CRISPR technology to allow us to manipulate genomes in the lab, in model organisms, uh, and really start to uh, make predictions uh, about what individual variants are doing in, in humans and have really uh, personalized genomic medicine, uh, I think that's, that's going to be a very exciting uh, part application of CRISPR technology over the coming uh, years and decades. So uh, in terms of uh, developing animal models and also engineering uh, uh, different uh, genomes, what I would think is that like a CRISPR is already made a lot of uh, 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 paradigm shifts, but one of the area that still echoes is uh, HDR, that is for creating uh, uh, precise animal models with uh, foreign sequence insertions. One example here is like a CRELOC system, which I told you in the uh, earlier uh, uh, answer, is that like uh, most of the mouse models that are created, nearly 90% of them are conditional knockout where you have to insert two lock besides. That area has been suffering quite a lot during the last four years, especially with CRISPR system. And a lot of people are putting a lot of emphasis on trying to develop CRISPR system to develop conditional knockout animal models. That said, there are only about 25% of the entire mouse genome has been converted into conditional knockouts during the last three decades. So everybody thought that CRISPR would help uh, complete that remaining 75% very fast, but unfortunately that has not happened. So next few years, I'm sure uh, people will put a lot of emphasis on uh, how to improve CRISPR system for developing a conditional knockout animal models. So in the next uh, five to 10 years, uh, definitely yes, in improving a humanized a CRISPR system for developing humanized animal models where uh, several uh, hundred kilobases to megabase genomes of uh, animal models will be replaced into uh, with uh, human models, human, human genome. So in terms of uh, therapeutic applications, it looks like a scientific uh, 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 kind of thing. So where you can use the CRISPR system as a kind of like a pill just to treat any kind of disease. So it, it looks like a scientific fiction, but at, at this time it is very hard to say what will happen in the next 20 years, 20 years, but it can certainly move fast uh, to the uh, level that like you just maybe eight out of 10 diseases have answers with the CRISPR system. So that's, that's what I'm anticipating. Uh, who knows, uh, in 10 to 20 years, what we'll be uh, using CRISPR for. So I actually prepare a slide, so if you can move to the next one. Yeah, so I, there's two things I think the, uh, CRISPR might be applicable. Uh, the future direction of the CRISPR in the proponent stem cell field. One is uh, we can use proponent stem cells to, stand the, to understand how this gene or certain mutation to affect the human development or human cell identity or how do they induce human cell defects. And in that scenario, then we can perform drug discovery. In the next several years, I perceive there will be a lot of um, gene or mutation specific drug that can identify the using this method. Uh, the second thing is uh, 
it's a relatively new concept, and uh, I believe it's also a very interesting direction to pursue is to perform this kind of isogenic iPSL based genome-wide association study. You know, in the last decades, people perform a lot of genome-wide association study. They use human populations, which is actually um, complicated by the hydrogenarity of the human population. And when people study the regular gen genome-wide association study, they need kind of several thousand or ten thousand patients. When they study gene, more complicated disease, when they study gene environmental interaction, they need even larger number of populations, so which is very expensive and technical challenging. So with the help of this CRISPR technology, we can create um, we can create the isogenic iPSL library through a, a goes by a very high throughput manner. So then we can differentiate shade these cells into the cell type we're interested in. And in the petri dish, basically, we can tightly control the environments. And we can tightly control the readout, what, uh, or in other ways, our definition of the defect of the disease. So in that scenario, we can use relatively small population and perform like a GWA study in the, petri, uh, in the disease model. So that also can help to uh, understand how this different genetic factor contribute to the disease. Thank you again to uh, John, Guru, and Shui Bing for your time and your insights. Uh, before we move into the uh, Q&A session, I'd like to mention that we have people available to further discuss pre-scatter or CRISPR with you after this presentation. So we'll send a follow-up email if you're interested in discussing CRISPR further. And now let's uh, move to the first question from the audience. So this is uh, regarding those off-target effects that we discussed. What are the precautions to omit the off-target sites? So I think when it comes to, to off-target, there's obviously a fair amount of work that can be done uh, using computational approaches uh, where you, know, you start to learn rules for, in it, for a given guide RNA in a given genome, uh, you know, where, where is it likely to target? So you can use that. Uh, to, to make some predictions, but of course predictions are not going to be perfect uh, and based on your threshold for uh, proof, you might or might not need to do additional experiments. For example, in a lab, uh, you know, you can design several different guide RNAs that all hit the same gene, that are all intended to hit the same gene, with the idea being that the off-target effects are going to sort of wash each other out uh, as you combine information from multiple on-target guides. So it's not an issue there. Uh, but it certainly is an issue as you think about therapeutic gene editing. Uh, and again, that kind of gets back to uh, an earlier question of what are the technologies we'll need to detect low frequency off-target effects in a population of cells uh, that, that are going to have a therapeutic application. Uh, and I think that's, that's, a, that's an open question. So uh, thank you. So the next question is, um, what are the current ways that we can deliver the CRISPR-Cas9 into cells? Um, and what are some uh, emerging alternative approaches that you think are promising for improving the delivery efficiency? Don, do you want to go? Uh, actually, one you uh, go first, more your area. Uh, yeah, so yeah, in terms of uh, animal models, like uh, we do micro-injection where we uh, just take the CRISPR-Cas system, whether it is uh, RNA or protein or two separate RNAs and the donor DNA and directly inject. So whereas delivering into cells, yes, certainly they need uh, more different kind of uh, platforms. The earlier mod uh, models worked with uh, like uh, delivering the plasmid DNA that transfect where you uh, have a single plasmid that expects both Cas9 and the guide RNA, and if you want to deliver uh, donor DNA, you co-transfect with the uh, donor plasmid or, uh, or uh, the oligonucleotide. So uh, very recently, like there are some uh, uh, newer developments. You don't have to use a plasmid; you just use a Cas9 protein and also single guide RNA that can be commercially synthesized. You just mix those two, and your donor DNA, if it is a plasmid or a, uh, oligonucleotide, you just cocktail all these things together and do the delivery using either uh, simple transfection or also using uh, electroporation. So I believe like uh, for embryonic stem cells and uh, pluripotent stem cells, uh, which uh, Shubin can add more information into this, 
they are, uh, they are becoming more popular, especially with the ribonucleoprotein and electroporation comp uh, uh, components both together. Yeah, so for human proponent stem cells, uh, if we just simply want to knock out a gene, we usually just use antivirus or virus-based delivery of um, Cas9 system. And if we want to do a um, single nucleotide mutation involved the subcloning, so in that scenario we most time use the electro operation so that um, the Cas9 will be only transiently expressed, so we don't worry too much about the incorporation into the genome system. Thank you. Um, the next question uh, is regarding um, the point that was brought up about creating libraries of CRISPR modified cells for drug discovery. Um, there was a question about um, if, if you could talk a little bit um, more about um, what that would look like. Um, uh, and Shrebin, could you take this question? Yeah, so uh, for example, what we, uh, for this field, we, we you, People originally start from some um, mutation that's caused uh, a fetal defect or um, congenital defect. So in that scenario, using the what people do is if we, uh, for example, for, from previous study that we know certain genes or certain mutations that can involve in um, beta cell development or cardio development or neuron development, and then we knock in or knock, knock out this gene or knock in this mutation in the human proponent stem cell and differentiate into the cell, uh, corresponding cell types and compare to the uh, wild type and mutant cells to see what's the difference. And now in this, in this year and uh, in last year and this year, kind of the feel move to the more um, broad concept because uh, the genome mutations related with congenital defect are pretty limited and their contribution to the human disease is also not um, not as broad as um, other mutations. So now kind of the field move to study how this uh, genome-wide association study identify gene, what the function of these genes are, or what the function of these mutations contribute to the disease. So in that scenario, it's got a little bit uh, more complicated because uh, for certain mutations, for certain genes we are studying, we might not expect to see the cellular defect immediately directly in the culture dish. So in that scenario, we might want to um, add some environmental stimulations to see the cellular defect. For example, uh, our recent study on the type 2 diabetes, we find that if we just knock out uh, uh, type 2 diabetes associated gene, they can differentiate into pancreatic beta cells without any major defect. However, if you challenge them with a high glucose condition, which kind of mimic the glucose toxicity in type 2 diabetes patient, the cells cannot handle this glucose toxicity very well. So in that scenario, the cell can, uh, this kind of study can be adapted to a, a high throughput screening platform. So uh, we screen uh, around 2,000 compounds, which include the FDA-approved drug and also drug in the clinical trials, so we can re run a drug repurposing study. So that's basically um, how we perform the screening. Great, thank you. Mm -hmm. um, so the next question um, is about um, designing primers. So do you have any um, special recommendations for the most promising tools for designing primers, um, in particular, um, for the case of plants and agriculture. So I can uh, take this answer, although my expertise is, uh, question, although my expertise is not in uh, plant models, so what I would think is that molecular biology is molecular biology regardless of organism. So what I would think is that like if uh, this question is related to designing primers for synthesizing guide RNAs. I think it should be quite standard. Any tools that are available on perhaps AdGene is one of the best sites where you can get into learning uh, what are the tools available for uh, CRISPR-Cas system, particularly in plants. And for uh, designing uh, primers for genotyping, perhaps they also follow the same rules. Uh, I hope that answers your questions, but I'm not very sure what exactly is uh, uh, the person looking for in this question. Uh, thank you, Guru. Uh, so the next question uh, is uh, going back to uh, next generation sequencing, um, which um, 
John brought up at the beginning of the discussion. Um, so could you elaborate on the role that NGS has played in uh, research using CRISPR um, and moving forward to agricultural or therapeutic applications, um, how could NGS be leveraged? Yeah, so I'll, I'll start with that. So I think that, uh, you know, that there's been a real trend in, in biology for the last uh, 10 years or so where if you could take your question of interest and turn it into a sequencing-based question. In other words, can you ask your question in a way where the readout uh, can be determined by next generation sequencing. Uh, that's been an enormously productive way of, of doing research because it's such a, uh, a high depth readout. You get so much information uh, and the, the cost has continued to go down and down and it's just been a lot easier and a more accessible technology. Uh, so I think that in terms of developing the CRISPR technology at the outset, uh, having next generation sequencing was, was really critical. Uh, it allowed the field to move very quickly. I also think that as we move towards therapeutic applications, or I guess agricultural uh, applications, uh, you know, I think a lot of, the, again, a lot of the readouts of safety and efficacy, and especially safety when it comes to off-target effects, uh, NGS is going to have a tremendous role to play in that, because I can't really imagine any, any other way of determining uh, in, a, in a broad, high-throughput, unbiased way where uh, off-target effects might be and what the potential vulnerabilities of any individual guide RNA might be in a genome uh, without using next-generation sequencing. So, uh, you know, it's already something that is used quite widely, uh, and I would imagine that, that trend to continue. Great. Uh, great. Thank you, John. Um, so we are out of time for further questions. I want to thank the uh, panelists once again and also thank you to the audience for uh, attending this webinar. And we will uh, follow up with you after it in case you have any further questions about CRISPR or about PreScatter. <laughs>